see you. Had a great uh, first service turnout, and we're thankful for, for you all that are here. Also want to welcome those uh, who are watching online. Uh, wish you could be here unless you're running a fever, and in that case, we don't want you here. Uh, just, just so you know, a couple weeks from today, September the 27th, we're going to be uh, unveiling, unrolling our 100-day uh, prayer challenge. We've put together a, ch a little card we want you to take with you, and we're going to challenge everybody who calls FCC home, whether you're here or online or wherever, uh, to pray for three specific things for the next 100 days, sort of leading into a new year and hopefully what will be a new season. So we're excited about that. Just make sure you're here uh, September the 27th. Now, if you're a person who watches a lot of television, you may be familiar with the show on ABC, What Would You Do? I have a picture of their host. It debuted in 2008, and it's now in its uh, 16th season. And the way it works is they set up these hidden cameras in these very public places, and then they have these professional actors come in, actresses, and they create these awkward scenarios, and they keep the, the cameras turned on the bystanders, the people who are not part of the production, but just the normal people who happen to be wherever it is, whatever it is that's playing out is happening. And the idea behind it is they want to see how do people react to what's happening in front of them. And if you've seen the show, then you know that some of the scenarios are rather intense. For example, recently had one where an older gentleman's in a crowded grocery store. There are people lined up behind him, waiting impatiently, and he's trying to pay for all of his groceries and change, and the cashier uh, is rude to him. So the question is, what are the people behind him? How do they respond to that? There's another one that was on recently about this mother and her son who are in a, a busy shoe store, and this huge argument erupts. He wants to play football. She says it's too dangerous, and they have this explosive argument, and you see these people around them. Do they join the argument, or do they keep their head down and keep running? Uh, my favorite one was one that was on a few months ago. You go to this fancy restaurant. There's a valet that's out front parking cars, and he appears to be drunk. So people are giving him their car keys, these expensive cars, and he seems to be uh, drunk. Back in 2018, the team from What Would You Do uh, visited the little town that I grew up in, and they set up a scenario inside of a grocery store that I used to work at. I've got a picture that was taken that day. Uh, the guy on the right is Mr. Fitch. He's the owner of the store. And one of the things I have on my resume is I'm a proud alum of the Leonard Fitch School of, of Customer Service. And they set up this scenario, and the reason they picked it, according to the producers, they had just read in Reader's Digest where Wilmore, Kentucky had been chosen as the nicest place in Kentucky, and they wanted to test that out, and since there's only one store there, that narrowed the options, and they chose the, the IGA. In the scenario, they brought in this professional actress, and she played a, a public school teacher who was buying supplies for her classroom out of her own pocket. When she got up to the register, though, her credit card is declined, and so she rummages through her purse, she grabs as much cash and change as she can scrounge up, but she's still short. So at that point, the cashier tells her she's going to have to put some items back. So she is sort of going through this in her head, and she, she moves to take back her personal stuff, which is the, you know, the milk and the bread and the eggs and all that, and she's going to use her money to pay for the school supplies. And it's then that you see this line of people who've gathered behind her start to pull out their money and pull their resources and pay for everything so that she can get what she needs. Now, thankfully, if you've seen the episode, there were plenty of people willing to help, which is, which is not always the case. But the response to the show was, was so strong that one guy who happened to be there at the store in that moment and was in line behind her actually received a marriage proposal from somebody who'd been watching the show across the country. So if you're single and you're looking, it might be, you might want to try to get on the show and, and, and do the right thing. But the producers of the show, they, they work hard to, to create these scenarios that are intense and they want to see how people respond. And it's meant to cause you to think, if, if I were in this situation, what would I do? So if I'm standing behind a teacher in a grocery store and she didn't have enough money to cover her supplies, what am I going to do? If I'm in a busy shoe store and I see a mom and her son and getting this huge argument, am I going to join the argument or am I going to stay out of it? If I go to a fancy restaurant and it looks like the valet is, is drunk, am I going to say anything or am I just going to let whatever happens happen? It's meant to cause you to think, what would, what would I do? Would I say anything, or would I just sort of keep my head down and keep moving? If you have your Bible or your phone with you, I want you to turn to, to John 13. And what you find there is really the, the ultimate what would you do scenario. 
Only rather than happening in a, in a public place surrounded by hidden cameras, it happens in a, in a private dinner in a secluded second story room. And just set this up for you, what we're going to read took place on Thursday night, the last Thursday night of Jesus' earthly life. In just a few hours after this dinner concludes, he'll be arrested. He'll be taken to stand trial. And the next day on Friday, he'll be crucified between, between two thieves. As the dinner commences, though, it's important to understand that Jesus is fully aware of everything that's about to take place. None of it will take him by surprise. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And with that in mind, he takes one last opportunity to gather with these 12 disciples, these, his closest friends, these guys that he spent three years of his life with. He's going to take one last opportunity to enjoy a meal with them, teach them some, some final things, and hopefully prepare them for what's about to happen. But it was in, that, in those quiet moments where they're away from the crowds, nobody else is around, it's just them and, and Jesus, that, that something completely unexpected happens. But before we read this, I want you to imagine just for a second that you're, that you're sitting around a table and around the table with you is everybody that's, that's ever wronged you, everybody that's, that's ever hurt you, the boss that threw you under the bus, the spouse that left you, the friend that stabbed you in the back, the person who stole from you, the person who hurt you, the coach who, who overlooked you, the, the classmate who insulted you, the love interest that ignored you. Everybody's there. Everybody in your life that's, that's ever wronged you is sitting at this table with you. And I want you to imagine that, that in that moment, you've been given the power to do whatever it is you want to do. You can lecture them. You can punish them. If you choose to, you can, you can even destroy them. You've been given that power. Now, here's the question. What would you do? During that period, whenever people would share a meal, the, the table they would use was very low to the ground, and so they would have to sit on the floor, and they would angle their body at sort of a weird angle so they could eat comfortably. It's called re reclining at the table. And because there was no such thing as electricity, the only light they would have would come from candles or these oil lamps, so it would cast some weird shadows. So you see this image. Here's Jesus, and he's surrounded by his 12 apostles, and they're sitting as he looks into the, the faces and the glow of that light. He knows exactly how they're going to respond over the coming hours. Jesus knew as they sit there in that room that Judas, one of his disciples, had already cut a deal with the religious leaders to betray him. And it was that deal that would, would spark a chain reaction of events that would end with Jesus hanging on a cross. He also knows that in just a few hours, Peter, who's sort of the, the tough guy of the group, the, the spokesman of the group, is going to deny knowing him on three separate occasions. And then Mark tells us that the rest of the guys, the other 10, when Jesus arrested, they all ran away and fled. So here's Jesus He's surrounded by guys that he's, he's invested three years of his life in. And now that the, the time is running out and the uh, time is winding down, he knows that one of them is going to betray him. One of them is going to deny knowing him. And all of them are going to abandon him. Now, here's my question. What would you have done? If that's you and you're Jesus, how would you have responded? Would you have lectured them? Maybe you take the last few minutes and just you know, tell them how disappointed you are in them. Guys, we've spent three years preparing for this, and I know what's going to happen. You guys are such disappointments. Or maybe if you're like me, you think about how can I hurt them like they're going to hurt me. I'm going to launch this preemptive strike and try to really put it to them before they put it, put it to me. I mean, that's the path that a lot of us would have chosen. It's not what Jesus does, though. Check out verse 1, John 13. It was just before the, the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to, to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, don't skip verse 3. This is sort of the, the key verse to understanding the magnitude of, of what's about to happen. If you were here last week, we talked about the, the sovereignty of God. And to say that God is sovereign means that you acknowledge that God has all, the, all power and all authority. 
And since Jesus comes from God, he's, John is telling us that Jesus has that, that same authority. He's, he's God in the flesh. He has that, that same power. That means Jesus had the authority to do whatever he wanted to do. If he wanted to raise the dead, he could do that. But the flip side of that is also true. If he wanted to destroy his enemies, he could have done that too. In fact, later on, when this meal is over, just a few hours later, the Roman soldiers will storm into the Garden of Gethsemane, and they'll take Jesus into custody. There's this cool scene where Peter, who's sort of the tough guy, as I said, he pulls his sword, and Jesus tells him to, to put his sword away because he doesn't need his sword, because if he wanted to, he could call down 12 legions of angels, which would be 72,000 angels, and within a matter of seconds, they could have destroyed all the enemies of Jesus. So don't miss this. As Jesus is, is sitting around the table with these guys who will all abandon him in his time of greatest need, all he would have needed to do would have just to, to snap his fingers. I mean, he could have just had a, a fleeting thought and he could have completely destroyed all of them. If he didn't want to destroy them, he then could have made their lives so miserable that they would have wished they were dead. He had the power to do that. Now, let me ask you again. If that were you, what would you have done? Check out verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to, to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was, was wrapped around. And during that time period, you know, there's no pavement. Everybody wears sandals everywhere they go, so they're walking around. Their feet are dusty and, and dirty, and if there's any rain, it gets gets kind of muddy so by the time they arrived wherever it is they were going their feet would be a nasty mess and part of being a good host meant having a servant available to wash the feet of your guests whenever they arrive but on this particular night because nobody is, because nobody is, knows about this it's a private dinner nobody's ready to made arrangements for a servant to be there so now you've got this extremely awkward situation. Nobody wants to wash the feet of the other people because you know if, you, if that's your job, you're like the low man in the organization, right? Nobody wants that job, and yet it needs to be done because nobody wants to sit around a table surrounded by people with dirty feet. So everybody's sort of looking at each other, wondering who's going to stoop, who's going to lower themselves to accepting the worst possible job you could have. It gets even more awkward, though, when you realize that upon entering into that room, the disciples, here they are to share this, this final meal together, and instead of focusing on encouraging one another, they, they revisit an argument that they had over and over again throughout their time together. Luke summarizes like this in Luke 22. It says, a dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was considered to be the greatest. Here they are, their last night together. What are they doing? They're arguing about who's going to be the the leader of the group, who's the second man on the totem pole, who's the, the greatest. And just like us, they were always jockeying for position. They were always trying to figure out where they ranked in relation to one another. And so they come to this upper room, and rather than encouraging one another, they, they break out in this argument, and they realize there are no servants there to, to wash anybody's feet. So rather than one of them choosing to do it, which would be like admitting you weren't the top dog in the organization, rather than one of them choosing to serve the others, they all argue. And in the middle of their argument, they hear the, the water slosh in that bowl. And they turn around, they see Jesus standing there with a towel and a bowl of water. In that moment, you could have heard a, a pin drop because it went against everything they, they thought they knew about being a person of influence. Last few weeks, we've been talking about the, the reset button. The idea behind it is that for a lot of us, the, the normal that we're, we're so desperate to get back to it really wasn't all that great to start with. And so we're trying to create a, a new normal that's better than the, the old normal. And one of the areas where a lot of us need to experience a reset is in how we serve the people around us. We need to transition from, from the selfishness that defines so many of us to the servanthood that, that Jesus modeled for us. If you look at this passage, there are three choices you have to make in order to get there. And here's, here's the first one. You have, to, you have to choose humility over prominence. You have to learn to, to choose to, to humble yourself rather than, than always seeking the spotlight. You ever notice that two people can look at the same exact scenario and see it from completely different angles? 
You see it in sports. You see it in politics. You see it in relationships. And when you look at what happens here in John 13, you see that Jesus and his disciples are in the same room. They're faced with the same scenario, and yet they're, they're looking at it through two completely different lenses. It's almost as if they have two different filters that they're using to, to evaluate what their response should be. The disciples look at this, and the question they ask is the same question that a lot of us ask. It's, it's what's in it for me? Remember, their main concern had been, who's number one? What, so the, when they see this, their question is, what's going to elevate me? What's going to make me more prominent? What's in it for me? You ever found yourself, you found yourself asking that question? You see some situation that, that needs attention, and rather than jumping in and doing something, you have this, this series of questions that you go through in your mind. How's this going to make me look? Are other people going to give me credit for doing this? Is this going to be, is there going to be any financial reward for this? Are people around me going to recognize me for this? If the very least, can somebody take a picture of me doing this so I can, you know, post it on Facebook and get some likes later? I mean, is there anything in this for me? That's the question a lot of us ask. But whenever you ask that question, you're using the wrong filter. Look at Jesus in this example, and you see that he's using a completely different angle. Rather than asking what's in it for me, he's asking the question, what needs to be done? Totally different question. See, he's not at all concerned about how the other guys in the group are going to view him because he's completely secure in who he is. And so he's, he's free to choose humility over prominence. He's, he's free to choose being a servant rather than, than seeking the spotlight. Philippians 2, there's this incredible passage where the Apostle Paul describes how we're supposed to do the same thing. We're supposed to follow his lead. Here's what he says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset is Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Rather than focusing on what's in it for me, Jesus asked what can be, what needs to be done. Rather than focusing on protecting his image, Jesus focused on giving away his power. Rather than focusing on being served, Jesus focused on on serving. My favorite writer is a guy named Bob Goff. He's got a great quote in one of his books. He says this, our lives will never be about Jesus if we keep making everything about ourselves. And one of the key indicators that you're, you're struggling with selfishness is when you ask the question, what's in it for me rather than what needs to be done? It means if you want the new normal, to be better than the old normal, you've got to switch up the questions. You've got you to change filters. Here's a second choice that has to be made during this transition. It's, it's the choice to choose love over judgment. Uh, you keep reading this passage. There's this incredible exchange that takes place starting in verse 6. Here's what happens. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have, who have need, who have had a bath, need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you're clean, though not every one of you. So what you see happening here is something that happens a lot in, in the life of Jesus. He says something the disciples, because they're coming at it from such varied angles, misunderstanding him, so Jesus does his best to explain it. And sometimes they get it, but more often than not, it goes over their head. But when you get to verse 11, that's the verse that sort of jumps off the page at me. Here's what it says. For he knew who was going to betray him. Let's sink in a minute. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So at this point in the evening, Jesus is, is fully aware that Judas has already cut the deal with the religious leaders. He also knows that Peter, despite all his bravado, is going to deny even knowing him. And yet, rather than, than passing judgment on these guys who will, who will turn their backs on him, he instead chooses to demonstrate his love for them by washing, washing their feet. Let me ask you, how do you normally respond to the people who've hurt you? How about this? How, how do you normally treat the people who disagree with you? 
Do you lecture them? Do you try to correct them? Do you try to make your case? Maybe you try to inflict some punishment on them. And here's Jesus. I mean, he goes out of his way to demonstrate his love for people that he knows are going to, to stab him in the back. And then just to make sure they get the message, when he's done washing their feet, he explains what he's just done, starting in verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked him. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you as an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Make sure you catch verse 14. Now, you read this, and Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you would expect him to say, you should wash my feet. I mean, that would be the expectation. In a lot of ways, that would be easier. That's not what he said. He said, now that I've washed your feet, your job is to wash one another's feet. And if you're like me, there's a part of you that wants to sort of push back against that. You know, you think, okay, Jesus, I get what you're saying, but you obviously do not know the same people that I know because I don't want to get anywhere near these people, much less do anything to, to serve them. So you think, Jesus, uh, what about the people that disagree with me? What about the people who, who vote differently than I vote? What about the people who have said mean things about me? What about the people who have, who have criticized me? What about the people that aren't interested in following you? What about the people who have overlooked me and pushed me to the side and, and stabbed me in the back? Surely, surely you don't expect me to wash their feet. And then you hear that voice of Jesus that says, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. See, part of the deal is if you want to be more like Jesus, you have to learn to choose love and demonstrating love over judgment. Now, one more choice that has to be made, and, and for a lot of us, this will be the dividing line. You know, we understand what it means to choose humility over prominence. We understand what it means to choose love uh, over judgment, but this is the one that gets most of us. You have to choose action over feelings. If you still have your Bible up, I don't want you to read verse 17 with me. This is one you you might want to underline. Here's what it says. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There's an incredible promise here, but, but make sure you understand it, it's a conditional promise. Jesus said, you can be blessed. You can experience life as it was meant to be lived. You can have a life that's defined by peace and joy and, and prosperity and peaceful relationships and deep satisfaction. I mean, you can have that. It's available to everybody. There's nobody that it's not available to. Everybody's invited to experience that. And yet, it's conditioned upon actually doing the things that Jesus told us to do. Here's the deal. All of us know what we're supposed to do. I mean, that's never the issue. And we, we always know where we stumble and where we fall, where we, where we drop the ball is actually doing it. I mean, we all know what it is we're supposed to do. It's just that we, we rarely do it. And for the problem is for most of us, we allow our feelings to control us. So we see something needs to be done, and unless we feel like doing it in that exact moment, we don't do it. We just put our head down and, and keep moving. If you're like me, you rarely feel like doing what needs to be done. Let me give you an example. A few weeks ago, uh, I was in my office late one afternoon and uh, working a little bit late, and I looked out the window in my office, and I noticed that in the, in the gravel parking lot that's over here, in one corner, there were these weeds that were about this high, and it just bothered me. I don't know what it is, like, if, if you went to my house, and please don't do this, don't judge me, but, like, weeds at my house don't bother me, you know what I mean? But weeds here drive me crazy, and I don't know, it's irrational, I know, but there, there's something about that. So I made this, this mental note, I thought, I need to pull those weeds before I go home. And then the phone rang, and it got busy. Now, I got this thing, you know, you don't want your church property to, to look like it's abandoned. You know, you want people to drive by and think, boy, they really take good care of their stuff. They must think what they're doing is important. But in that moment, the phone rang. I got busy, went home, didn't even think about it. 
A week later, the same thing happened. I was sitting in my office. I look out the window, and I see the same weeds. Only this time, instead of being like this high, they're now up here. I mean, you know how, you know how it goes. And I thought to myself, man, I have got to go out there and pull those weeds. This is ridiculous. It looks like we're just abandoning our parking lot. I've got to go out there. And then I had a second thought. I thought, man, it's really hot right now. And maybe when it cools off later, I'll go out there and pull those weeds. Fast forward two weeks into the future. We're having an elders meeting on a Wednesday night. That afternoon, I made a list of things that I thought we need to talk about, and most of them were were pretty significant. So I went home for a minute. I come back, and I pull in the parking lot, and I notice those weeds over there. And I've got about 20 minutes before the elders meeting starts. So here's what I did. I went in my office. I got out my legal pad, and I wrote down number eight on my list. We need to talk about these weeds in the parking lot. Now, I had known about them for a month at this point. So we go through the first seven things on my list. We come to number eight, and I, boy, I launched into a sermon so passionate talking about these weeds and how we've got to do a better job taking care of our property, and we don't want people driving by here and thinking we don't care, and et cetera, et cetera. And it was a very passionate presentation. And then when the meeting was over, I got in my car, and I drove home. Fast forward to the next morning. Thursday morning, I took Cannon, my, my son, over to school, I dropped him off at school at exactly 7.30 a.m. I crossed Michigan Avenue. I went down the little one-way street over here. I turned left into the, the parking lot, fully expecting to see those weeds standing there taunting me. But instead, what I saw was Charles Fletcher, our oldest elder, on his hands and knees at 7.30 in the morning, pulling those weeds out. Now, I had known about them for over a month. Charles had known about them for about nine hours, and he had them pulled up. Now, here's the deal. I thought a lot about those weeds. I'd look out the window, and I'd see them blowing the breeze, and it'd just make me angry. I'd go home at night, and I'd sit down to eat dinner, and I'd think, I've got to do something about those weeds. I'd get up and, and eat breakfast, and i think, today's the day. I'm going to pull those weeds. I thought about those weeds a lot. I kept thinking, I've got to pull those weeds. I even made a presentation in an elders meeting about weeds, but I never actually pulled them. I knew about them. I thought about them. I even complained about them, but I didn't do anything. See, the Bible, Jesus doesn't say, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you, if you think about them or if you, if you complain about them. That's not what he said. He said, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. That's where a lot of us drop the ball. Now, I was thinking about that, and as much as it bugs me that, that I didn't pull those weeds, there are some other more important things that I've also left undone because I didn't feel like doing them, and you probably have too. And it's not that I didn't know what I was supposed to do, and it's not that you didn't know what you're supposed to do. It's just so far you haven't felt like doing it. So I want to challenge you this week, when you feel that, when you know that the Lord's telling you to do something, don't make excuses, just, just do it. For one week only, just no excuses, just, just decide, I'm going to choose action over feelings. If you need help figuring out what to do, in just a few minutes, Austin's going to come. He's going to explain something that we're doing this week called FCC Loves Monticello, the pandemic edition. Now, now we understand different people have different comfort levels when it comes to how much contact you want to have with other people. So we've come up with some scenarios that we think are very simple, uh, very easy, that you can simply and safe, uh, safely serve some, some other people. And we hope everybody will do that. But here's the deal. Everybody knows what you're supposed to do, but few of us actually do it. If the show... What would you do has a star? It would be the, the host of the show, this guy, ABC News correspondent John Quinones. Uh, he's, been, he's been the host of the show for, for all 16 seasons. If you watch the show, after each of the scenarios, he will come, he will emerge from behind the scenes or off camera, and he'll interview the people who were involved in the scene, not the, the actors, but just the normal people, the people who were uh, standing in line or the people who were watching what was unfolding. And he'll interview them, and he'll ask them questions about why they responded in the way they did, what was going through their head. And it's always, you know, eye-opening to hear people try to explain their reaction. Now, when you think about it, that's, that's not at all unlike 
what Jesus said was going to occur when you and I stand before him. And as uncomfortable as it may sound, he made it abundantly clear that, that you and I are going to stand before him and we're going to review our lives. And it's going to be much more intense than any hidden camera show. Every thought, every action, every word, it's, it's going to be like your life is an open book. And in that moment, the question is not going to be, what would you do? It's going to be, what did you do? Were you selfish or were you serving? Jesus said, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Not if you think about them. Not if you complain about them. But if you do them. Just a second, David's going to come. He's going to share with us a thought about communion. Then we're going to stand together. We're going to have an invitation song. Very simple. We had a, a baptism in the first service. If you'd like to pray with somebody, like to talk with somebody, you don't know what your next step should be, you come to this front row and Dave and I will be here.